you got a pencil. Yeah, I got it. I know what's in there, but leave it to the text. I'm a junior at Bothell High School, and that's in the area of Seattle, Washington. This is my third year in FTC, and I'm part of Team 8923, which is one of three teams in Swimmer Robotics Club. I, at Worlds, I'm assisting Team 3491 with uh, So as I built and uh, used the test bed, I was assisted by a number of mentors in the design, building, and programming of the test bed, including help with creating a presentation. So, uh, when this project began, the original goal was to build a battery tester to determine the health of batteries uh, that could reliably last through a match. So we could have just purchased an off-the-shelf battery tester to test the health of batteries, uh, but we took the opportunity to build multiple ways to test battery health into a test bed for FTC Robar components. So this picture right here was taken during the early design stages of the project. So, um, building this test bed was a lot of fun as well as educational. Uh, test beds are common in many industries and they enable components to be tested in isolation, which improves the ease of troubleshooting, including in the field. Uh, they are used for uh, testing prototype components and for validating warranty services. For example, Boeing has a mobile test bed that they use to test jet engines with. Uh, so, for us, test beds are useful for finding out what the real problem is in a multi component environment. For example, if a phone can't find a motor controller, is the motor controller not connecting, or is the phone just not seeing it? Uh, this test bed contains all known new components, so we can use it to help make that determination. Uh, we can use the test bed to evaluate many aspects of robot components. Uh, we can test a battery to determine if it is going to last reliably through a match. We can test servo controllers, motor controllers, and the power distribution module including whether the app on the phone is seeing them or if they are actually not connected. So one of the things we have tested in the past is, is this module leaking power? One team in our club was losing battery power quickly and they wanted to see if their motor controller was a problem. We can test the core device interface module to see if it connects correctly and we can test anything uh, like sensors that are plugged into it. We have also used the test bed to measure how much current a robot draws during certain actions. This allows the team that the robot belongs to to make decisions about how they use available power. So before building the test bed, I needed to understand Ohm's law and the specifications of FTC batteries and motors. Uh, I looked at similar projects that other teams had completed, mainly battery testers. Uh, I use Ohm's Law to estimate the sizes of some of the components I would need. So speaking of Ohm's Law, uh, when working with electricity, Ohm's Law is important because nearly everything you do can be explained or predicted mathematically. This diagram right here, E is voltage in volts, I is current in amps, and R is resistance in ohms. Uh, so when we uh, are <coughs> about intentionally draining a battery, we need to know how much resistance to use. So we wanted, we wanted a static drain test, where you hook up a battery to a set load, and watch what happens to the voltage as it drains. 
uh, throughout this presentation, I will refer to that as the static load test. Uh, there are commercial battery testers available, but uh, mainly for car batteries. There are also battery te uh, testers like the Battery Beak, which are specifically for Tetrix batteries. However, we wanted a tester that gave us the raw data and one that we could easily modify. We also wanted our tester to be able to be used as a test bed for components, not just batteries. So for our static load, we decided on three 25 watt one ohm resistors in series. So that's three ohms of resistance with a 75 watt rating. So we know using Ohm's law that that creates a four to five amp draw depending on the battery voltage. Uh, FTC robots can certainly draw more than four amps uh, during a match, but for our static test, uh, four to five amp, or three ohms allows uh, the battery to drain uh, slow enough not to be dangerous, but not too fat, or slow enough not to be dangerous, but uh, still observable. After we knew what we wanted our test bin to be able to do, uh, we designed and built the initial version. The black smear right here is, does, has nothing to do with it. I didn't put it there. Uh, so you can see here is a place to mount the battery. And we have the core power distribution module, the motor controller, and the core device interface module mounted right here. Here's a, right over here. We're going to mount the resistors uh, a little later. So a lot, as we move along, we'll see later versions of the test bed as it gets improved upon. So uh, we selected 1 16th inch aluminum mounting plate because it was strong, light, and relatively cheap, as well as being less prone to static electricity. Uh, we started out powering our test equipment, which is a motor controller, uh, core device interface module, and the core power distribution module with the battery that we were testing. Uh, however, uh, that was bad practice with a test bed because you don't want to power anything except the test load with your device under test. So we first changed to powering only the motor controller uh, with the test battery, and actually using an external battery to power the rest of the stuff. Uh, but then we changed again to take out the motor controller and only power the resistors with the battery we were testing. Uh, that eliminated any other power draw on our battery. So wire management has been an issue since we started. And it got even more complex in later versions, but planning where the wires will go at the same time you plan the rest of the hardware is a necessary step to good wire management. We use Anderson power bulbs for all our connectors, and this allows the test bit to be easily reconfigured because any module with Anderson power bulbs can be plugged into it. You can see that uh, we actually took off the stock connector on the core power distribution module and replaced it with Anderson power bulbs to allow us to connect it into anything. Excuse me, stupid question. Aluminum is conductive or not? I believe it is, yes. Why would you have a conductive material as the mounting piece? Um, the polycarbonate was the other material we looked at. And if you, you can even feel if you rub it on your leg, it's going to get a lot of static electricity on it. And also, um, aluminum is conductive, so it allows for a common ground. Ah, OK. So, you can't see from this picture, but there are three 1 ohm resistors mounted to the back of the heat sink here with thermal conductive putty to allow for even more heat transfer. Uh, we estimated that the heat sink would heat up to about 50 degrees Celsius, so if we don't dissipate that heat correctly, the resistors actually might change resistance at high temperatures. So, <coughs> 4 to 5 amps over 15 minutes yields a heat sink that's quite hot to the touch, but it's probably not going to start a fire. So the infrared thermometer we had did not work well against the bright, shiny aluminum of the heat sink. So you spray pin on that side black right there if you can see it. So that slightly improved our temperature measuring, but it's still not very accurate. I would not recommend using an infrared thermometer. So just to be on the safe side, I added a small fan right here as well. Uh, so with the fan running, the heat sink is still very hot, but it's not dangerous. So. Uh, this is a wiring diagram of the initial version of the test bed. Red wires are positive, black wires are negative, and uh, blue wires are USB cables. So I'll pause and let you look over it. So the resistors are emulating motors themselves in that picture? 
Um, they're not actually designed to emulate anything specific. It's just a load that gives us a convenient drain time, so it's not to be too fast to heat up the battery too much, and not to be too slow as to be inconvenient to test. But you're only powering from the motor controller. Yes, it does happen to be powered from the motor controller in this version. However, in later versions, uh, we changed it to get rid of the motor controller. Okay. Yes. All right. So uh, here you can see that the external battery is powering our test equipment, the power distribution module, the core device interface module, uh, and the fan, which is being powered through the core device interface module. So our external battery is powering all that test equipment, while our battery under test is only powering the motor controller and the fan, which slightly uh, significantly reduces the draw on our test battery. So unfortunately, while this setup is relatively simple, some of our voltage is lost powering the motor controller from the test battery. So that can actually affect our results a little bit. And by the way, our phone is connected through the USB port on the power distribution module, but it has its own battery, so it does not affect the data. So the hardware on the test bed can be reconfigured to test many different aspects of a robot or of an individual component. Uh, to create and log data specific to the element we are using, we needed a separate op mode for each item. As we find new uses for the test bed, we will create still more op modes. Each op mode writes data to the log differently, so we do, we do not have to write all aspects of performance to the log at once. So for example, if we're testing a sensor, we do not need to log battery voltage. Well, during the test, uh, the, phone's, the telemetry on the phone screen in this blue box right here displays data about what's going on, including the state of the relays we use, the voltage, the elapsed time, and the current. So uh, as we began to test batteries, we ran into a bug where tests would just die after an inconsistent amount of time. So sometimes the FTC app would freeze after a minute or less, and other times it took 10 minutes or more. So after doing some debugging, we determined that this was an issue with the FTC app and not with our code. So it turns out that a problem in the FTC framework was exposed uh, when this app ran for long duration tests. The app was only designed to run for the two or three minutes it would take to run a match. So when we ran it for our static drain test for a very long time, uh, it would cause a uh, freeze all the time. So since we could reproduce this bug 100% of the time, we showed it to Bob Atkinson, who's one of the creators of the FTC app. Uh, he determined that the problem was, he confirmed that it was not with our code, and that it was an issue in the, F, uh, in the thread management portion of the FTC app. So a few days later, an update was released to fix that problem. Uh, and this is valuable for FTC as a whole, because the same issue we saw occasionally causing robots to freeze during matches early in the year uh, no longer occurs, at least due to this problem. So our test bed could confirm that the issue was fixed because the bug that used to occur consistently no longer occurred at all. And making test beds like this, or test beds like this, this is exactly what they're supposed to do, is be able to diagnose a problem like this. So this test bed can find all robot components using the first app without any modification, just like it would on a robot. And it's also worth noting that the core device interface module can be used by itself. We have our phone directly plugged into it without the use of the core power distribution module. So, when a team goes into a match, they want to be sure that everything on their robot is going to function like they want. And that includes the battery. So determining battery health was the initial motivation for this project. And now I'll start going into what we found. So, it's time to talk about batteries. Here are some basics about the batteries that FTC uses. Um, we think of batteries like a tank of water that we drain. There's a spigot fastened on the side and you can open it and let water come out. Uh, in reality, the spigot's actually very high on the tank, making it uh, so we can't actually get out all the power we want. Uh, in fact, only the top 10 to 15 percent right here uh, can let you, or allows you to have full power for maneuvers like hanging. Uh, and as you get down into the yellow, you're somewhat limited, whereas getting into the red, you'll really start to notice uh, less power that you're, than you usually have. So uh, most battery vendors recommend draining ba uh, that batteries are drained no lower than 80% of their capacity before they are recharged. And draining batteries below 80%, especially draining to 60% or lower, can damage the battery. 
that can increase its internal resistance and dramatically reduce the number of recharge cycles before the battery is no longer serviceable. Uh, from a power perspective, it would be better if we could do the most power intensive maneuver first, like hanging, that operate only on low amperage in the end game. However, sadly, we can't do this due to how the matches are set up. Our sister team, 6220, found that they cannot hang once their battery voltage drops below about 11.75 volts. So our test bed can measure the health of a battery in several ways. Um, we measure the time that batteries lasted under load before dropping to 11.5 volts, the total power provided, and the internal resistance. We took measurements of all of those on a known good battery to establish a baseline, and we compared other batteries to it. Uh, the approach we took was to connect the battery being tested up to a static load of three ohms. We recorded the voltage every five seconds to a log on the phone, stopping at 11.5 volts so as not to damage the battery by draining it too low. It turns out the resistance that was provided by the wires and connections we used was around 0.2 ohms, so we had a total of about 3.2 ohms of resistance. We actually only found that out fairly recently. Because of that, we had to redo some of our tests because the having different resistance affected the data. So when making a test bid, I would recommend checking everything with a multimeter before actually using the test bid or collecting data from it. So another way to test battery health is to measure battery capacity. To use our water analogy, the capacity test measures how much water came out of the tank. That represents the total power given by the battery in watt hours. So a watt hour is how much uh, came out into this bucket in about an hour. In exact, exactly an hour. So, to perform the capacity test, we took voltage from our static load data, and using Ohm's law, we calculated the current. We then multiplied the current by the voltage to obtain watts. Then we calculated the cumulative watts delivered over the duration of the test for each battery in watt hours. Uh, we used a spreadsheet to do this. This is the most relevant test because what we really care about is how much power the battery can provide for a match. Uh, this test gives an absolute measurement of battery health, and a good battery will always have high capacity, while a bad battery will always have low capacity. So, another way to evaluate battery health is measuring internal resistance. So, looking at this picture over here, we see that internal resistance of a battery builds up over time like the gunk on the inside of a pipe. Uh, it restricts the flow and lowers voltage. So this is a, uh, internal resistance acts as a, resi a resistor inside the battery, and it drops the voltage immediately before it leaves the battery. Our, expection, our expectation was that internal resistance would be a good predictor of battery health, because abuse and age of a battery can cause internal resistance to rise. So to test the internal resistance of the battery, I first measured the open circuit voltage, then I measured the loaded voltage, and graph the voltage against the current between those two points. Uh, the slope of the line gave me the internal resistance, and I will demonstrate how to do that uh, after, after questions. So this wiring diagram is the current iteration of the test bed, and it includes the ability to perform a static load test and an internal resistance test. So since the draw of the motor controller in previous versions was affecting the data by putting additional load on the battery, it just took it out. So now we needed a different way to control uh, where the power went to the 3 ohm resistor, the 200 ohm resistor, to both or neither. So, uh, so now we're, we added relays to do what the motor controller had done previously. Uh, that relay controls the 200 ohm resistor. This relay right here controls the 3 ohm resistor. So by the way, uh, the volt core device interface module did not provide quite enough voltage to flip the relays. So we had to use transistors connected to a larger voltage source. Uh, and when we turned those on, it would flip the relay for us. So uh, we mistakenly used two larger relays for this. So if you do this and you actually use reasonably sized relays, you should not need to use uh, transistors. The core device interface module should be able to do it for you. Right. Uh, so as you can tell, this test bit is not finished and may never be finished. So we can reassemble and disassemble depending on the task at hand. In fact, uh, for our current purposes, we don't actually use this 200 ohm resistor right here. 
uh, but in the future, we plan to use it to measure internal resistance more accurately. So uh, I use this iteration of the test bit to run the battery tests. I'm going to show results for in a few moments. So this is what we decided that we needed a battery to be able to do while it was on a robot. plenty of room for delays in a match and for high power draw maneuvers like hanging. After we tested our batteries, we decided that a good battery had 13.5 or more volts after charging, still read 12 or more volts after being drained for 15 minutes, and has a relatively in low interval resistance of 0.3 ohms or less. So, this is a graph of the voltage over time of a good battery. Uh, this was provided by a static load test. Voltage starts at 14.3 right here, uh, immediately drops to 13.2 when we apply our load. So this first voltage was uh, open circuit, uh, was measured open circuit, so there's actually no load on the battery. And then it drops to 13.2 uh, right here when we actually put a load on it. So this battery is still able to provide uh, 12 volts, uh, dropping below right here, for about 16 minutes. Uh, this battery also has an internal resistance of 0.2 ohms, which is under our 0.3 ohm cutoff, which I'll get to that later. But this battery is definitely match capable. So this is the graph of a bad battery. So notice, though, like our good battery, this one also had the initial reading of 14.3 volts. However, when our 3 ohm load was applied, voltage dropped immediately, and it was only able to sustain 12 volts for about 40 seconds, dropped below right here. Uh, this also has an internal resistance of 0.64 ohms, which is way higher than any other battery we've tested. So this battery is definitely toast, uh, ready for the recycle bin. So what was the toast? Huh? What <laughs> oh, killed it? Um, we had an issue in our club uh, a few years ago where there was someone who was mistaken and thought that charging batteries at 1.8 amps instead of 0.9 amps would charge them faster. So we have a lot of uh, damaged batteries left over from that. How many times doing that really it? Uh, we haven't tested that because batteries are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that might be something we do in the future uh, if we think it's worth our money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
four one watt hours, that's 62% of the advertised 36 watt hour capacity of the battery. However, our battery started well above the advertised voltage, and we drained it to 11.5 volts rather than 12. So this purple line right here is a marginal battery, and it provided 48% of the battery's advertised capacity. The yellow line is our really bad battery, and it provided 1% of the advertised capacity. But remember, this battery still read 11.4 volts on a multimeter right after being charged. So since our good battery only delivered 62.62% of the advertised capacity, even though we drained it below what it was rated for, uh, that means that the uh, labels on the batteries are actually overstating what they can really deliver. <coughs> so um, after you determine the watt hour output of your batteries, you want to know how to apply that and what you should to what you should do with your batteries. So this is a chart of the batteries we tested. Uh, broken down into groups based on their total watt-hour output. Each bar represents how many batteries fell into that range out of the 15 batteries we tested. So uh, the highest group right here we called great batteries. Uh, I believe that was 20 to 25 watt-hours that they output. We will save those for finals matches at competitions. Uh, the next tier below that called good batteries, 15 to 20 watt-hours output. Uh, we will use those for qualified matches and competitions. And the next tier is OK batteries. We'll probably save those for testing back at the shop. We don't, we can't really rely on them for a match, especially if we have to do something like a hang at some point. Uh, the questionable batteries are right below that. Uh, those are ones we'll have to decide as a club whether we want to keep them for testing or we actually want to throw them out. And then there, right below that, we've got trash batteries. We found two of those. And they're completely toast. They're not even they're not even suitable for testing. They won't power a robot long enough to actually be of use to us. Used to us. So we'll throw those out. We'll throw those out. So since watt hour output is our best measure of battery health, we compared static load and internal resistance test results to, to it to see if they were uh, valid ways to measure battery health. So after eliminating one outlier. The correlation between the amount of time the batteries lasted in the static load test and the total watt hours at output had an R squared value of 0.9594. So that meant that it had a very strong correlation. So that also means that the static load test provides a very good indicator of battery health. So we had hoped to use internal resistance as a measure of battery health because it is quick to test, does not drain the battery, and it's very convenient. So, uh, however, when we correlated internal resistance test results to watt hours output, it had an R squared value of 0.3978. That meant there was an extremely weak correlation. So, unfortunately, we have not yet found a way to reliably correlate internal resistance with battery health. However, what we did find was that internal resistance on a bad battery will sometimes be more than, or sometimes be less than 0.3 ohms but we have not discovered any good batteries with internal resistance of more than 0.3 ohms. So that actually allows us to weed out some bad batteries using an internal resistance test if we find that they have more than 0.3 ohms of internal resistance. However, I uh, found a document online from a company called Albercore saying that they found internal resistance to be a very reliable indicator of battery health. So since they've successfully done this, we're going to continue to explore internal resistance as a convenient way to test batteries. So, uh, can a multimeter be used to test battery health? The answer, the answer is yes and no. So yes, in that a multimeter can detect bad batteries with low open circuit voltage, and no, in that as you saw in the last couple of slides, some freshly charged bad batteries have an open circuit voltage reading of 14 or more. So a multimeter can be used to weed out bad batteries there's an open circuit voltage of less than around 13 volts. However, if the open circuit voltage is more than 13, then that's a candidate for a good battery. It requires additional testing. So with a low applied, you can use a multimeter to monitor and log voltage over time by writing it down by hand, but that's uh, kind of a pain. So we use the voltage sensor and software, and the test bed allows us to record voltages over time <coughs> automatically instead of writing it down. So I'll be saving these charts and retesting these same batteries next fall to see how they hold up over time. Now, changing gears a little, uh, this picture was taken with the second configuration of the test bed. 
uh, the motor controller with the yellow label right here is being swapped in for one of our known good controllers. Uh, it's being tested because the team it belonged to thought it was questionable. Uh, the test bed has the ability to do this with components other than a motor controller, like a core device interface module, or anything plugged into that. So setting this test up was quick and easy because we have, because of how we use Anderson power bolts for all our connectors. You see, uh, this battery has Anderson power bolt on it, so it can be plugged right into the motor controller. And the resistors also, you see the resistors right here, the wire comes down through here, also plugged into the motor controller using Anderson power bolts. So this picture shows an example where we use the test bed to measure the amount of current that one of our sister teams, 6220, needs to hang. Uh, 6220 was having trouble with not having enough battery power to hang. So after this test, they reduced their amperage draw by giving less power to some motors so as not to exceed what their battery can provide at the end of the match. So to make this reading, we used a long power cable between the test bed and the robot. So the uh, power cable is plugged into the battery of the test bed actually, and it goes into the robot and powers the robot, but with the test bed battery. Uh, so an op-load program on the phone screen of the test bed uh, displays the current uh, displays a current draw, and so we measured a maximum draw of 10.3 amps that way. However, the current sensor we used was not capable of measuring that much current, so we replaced the shunt resistor on the sensor the 0.03 ohm resistor, and that raised the sensor's range from 3.2 amps to 10.67 amps. Now that's my friend Hank, who helped me with attaching some of the connectors on the wires. Uh, during this project, I learned uh, what amperage, voltage, and resistance are, and I learned how they pertain to robots. I learned about using Ohm's law to calculate what will happen when a circuit is powered. I also learned about transistors, relays, resistors, how to use them what makes a good battery, a bad battery, and how to spot them. So after collecting the data, after collecting the data, I learned a lot about how to create charts in Excel and how it can be useful for analyzing data. Much of what I discovered is valuable for FTC as a whole because it allows teams to choose batteries that will reliably get them through a match. So Swerve now has a very useful tool to test batteries and other robot components by themselves, and we will continue to use this for seasons to come. I also learned about creating and giving an effective presentation. I would encourage every club to build a test bed, both for the experience of building one, as well as for the value it brings as a testing device for batteries and for robot components. I encountered an amazing number of nuances with FTC technologies that could potentially negatively impact robot performance if they're not accounted for. I'll post more information about these on our website. So as we use this test bed over the next few years, we will surely find more uses for it, ways to expand it, and we'll uncover and learn about more of these cool nuances which you can share with and benefit the FTC community. So this presentation, <coughs> the both wiring diagrams, the URL to the Albert Core document, and some uh, battery test results, as well as other findings that I haven't covered yet, uh, will it'll shortly be on the Swerve Robotics web page up there. So after this, after questions, uh, after this conference is over, sorry, this test bed will be in 6220's pit at Fire 47, and you can drop by if you'd actually like to test any of your own modules or batteries that you're not sure about. So after questions, I'll do questions, and then after that, if anyone wants to stick around, I'll go over how internal resistance is calculated, and I'll demonstrate an internal resistance test on one of the batteries that I brought with me. So thank you all for attending. Um, you tested the motor controller. How exactly did you do that? Okay, so the test bed we had, right, sorry. Uh, the test bed we had contains all known good components, so it always connects. So if something's not connecting, or so if something's not in the test bed is not connecting, we know for sure that that's the problem. So what we did was we unplugged the motor controller we currently have in, we swapped in that motor controller, and if that if we, it didn't connect, then we knew that that motor controller was a problem, because nothing else could possibly be the problem. Okay, so you're, you're pot part swapping. Yes. Got it. Okay. Have you used the um, the software that they released to test the motor 
controller that Modern Robotics released. You could download the software, plug in the motor controller, and it'll test it for you. Um, I've heard about this software, but no, we haven't really gone into it. It was, it's the same thing that I put the battery beat. Uh, you can use it to test battery health, but we wanted it to be multi-purpose, and we wanted the raw data so we could actually do, what it, do exactly what we wanted. We didn't just want an answer, this is good or this is bad, we wanted to be able to look at it by ourselves and, uh, and look at each aspect of it, not just whatever the software tests. I'd just be curious to see if the one that you test and, and say is bad says it's bad with theirs, because we had multiple ones that um, they said they were bad and then they were good. <laughs> Yeah, um, vice versa. That might be something we do in the future is actually use the software, compare with all the different motor controllers we have, and see how consistent it is. You said draining batteries below 80% could damage it. 80% voltage? 80%. Of voltage or uh, yes. or Okay. And how about charging the batteries? Have you come up with any uh, recommendation as far <coughs> as? Um, cycling them or not having them on the charger for X amount of time? Um, aside from the not charging them at the wrong amperage, uh, one of the things we so recently... What? The wrong amperage, the 1.8? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aside from not accidentally moving the switch, one of the things we recently discovered was that uh, if uh, nice, batter, nice battery chargers will have little temperature sensors on the battery so when it starts to heat up it stops charging. But uh, our battery chargers do not do that. They look for a little voltage drop at the end, which signals that the battery is done charging. So we noticed that if you took a battery off after it was done charging, uh, and then you plugged it in again, the uh, battery tech charger would keep looking for that voltage drop, but it would, it would never actually see it because it already happened. So it would just keep trying to charge it on that. That's another way that we've damaged batteries in the past. Is that the one that comes in the kid parts? So is, is your recommendation then is to charge them up and then take them off the charger even for months at a time? Um, I believe if, if if the charger is showing a green light, it's no longer charging it. So I don't believe that should be an issue. Uh, we haven't really looked into that that much. Uh, what we do is we have whiteboard strips on the back of the batteries. We put a check for charged and an X for not charged. So that actually helps us manage our batteries a little better. But I've heard that nickel metal hydride batteries are actually really bad at retaining their charge if you leave them, if you don't use them for a while. So I don't know if it actually permanently damages it, but you definitely can't leave your battery sit for a month and then expect it to have the full power. Does the battery testing charging process actually damage the battery? Uh, it takes off about one recharge cycle. So each battery will come with a certain amount of recharge cycles, give or take a few. Um, and then whenever you damage the battery a little, it takes away a lot of recharge cycles. But this only does one. It's just like using it in a robot normally. Does the software kill the test when it gets under 11? Yes, when it gets to 11.5. When it gets below 11.5, it just switches off. So the battery is no longer drained after that. I'm, I'm sorry, I came in late. What? Um, what amperage draw are you are you pulling off batteries? Uh, it depends on the battery voltage, but we have a load of 3.2 ohms, so uh, three or five amps, depending on how low it gets. And what's your peak amperage draw on your robot? Uh, 6220 had it hit 10.3 amps, but they took steps to reduce it after that. Uh, I haven't tested on our robot, but that would definitely be a good test to do to take a bunch of different robots and look at an average amperage draw for a robot. And did they find that that amperage draw was detrimental to the robot somehow? Did it disconnect or anything? <laughs> well, uh, there's their mentors right there. <laughs> yeah, it's it's I think ours all have 15 amp fuses. <coughs> I think they came with 15 amp fuses. And I think that's what the FTC manual says too. Is 
that you can run up to a 15. We put a 20 amp, but they wouldn't let us run. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Motor controllers, chips are actually in the 40 amps. Motors are The, the phone is recording the voltage. You did the analysis of the circuit to find the resistance, and that's how you got the amperage. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. We actually had, we actually have a current sensor, but something <coughs> we noticed that there were something there was something wrong with it, and we uh, that was only a few weeks ago, so we didn't have time to troubleshoot it. So we actually just calculated it manually using Ohm's law instead of using the sensor, but we'll look into using the sensor for a more accurate measurement in the future. Because you did theoretical instead of experimental. Yes. Well, you yeah. did theoretical on the on the ohms. No, we actually knew ohms and voltage, so we used that to calculate amperage. So the amperage was calculated, and the volts and ohms were measured. But but you found an error that your your ohms were wrong initially. Uh, yeah, initially before we calculated it, uh, the ohms or sorry, the amps. Yes, yes, we did. We had to use a multimeter to check it uh, because we did not think about wires and connections right. providing resistance. But it turned out they did. If you know two, you the third, three, the third yes. is automatic. There's no mistaking it, right? So, I, I would not right. the resistance characterize was measured. that as theoretical. Right, that's not theoretical. Right. The resistance was measured with the multimeter, and we knew the voltage because that was also measured. The current sensor was just reporting, we knew it should have been reporting 4.1, and it was reporting 5.6. So there was just something wrong with the, the maybe John knows what it was, something wrong with the, the sensor. Sure. So they're not heating up, they're not changing. They're not heating up and then changing the resistance. They're specified to stay within 1%. So it wasn't there. Not there. Thank you. 
oops, sorry, it, also, it says infinity because I forgot to plug in the battery. So plug in the battery, do it again, and it pops out as 0.52 volts. So, so it's not a bad battery. It is the open circuit? Yes. Then it is the reload <coughs> circuit. Yes, so what you hear is uh, this relay is actually clicking. If you want to put your finger on it, I think you can feel it as it goes. No, I actually heard it. Okay, yeah. Oh, so, so the program is firing the relay by basically turning on the motor, right? Um, How is it firing the relay? It's using the core device interface module. It's plugged into, it. I talked about how the transistors, uh -huh. you don't need to use transistors, but we had to. So it's actually firing it using the core device interface module. Got it. So what it's doing is it's quickly taking a measurement from this, and then it's firing this, and then it's taking another measurement, and then it's turning this off so it doesn't drain the battery and then it's displaying the internal resistance. So the, the relay is uh, digital? It's a digital device. Yes, digital these output. are the two relays. Okay. So you got your digital output. Um, this is a fan right here. That's just driving um, that yes. so that you can turn it on. So this want. I2C device right here is a, a voltage sensor. And this right here is just establishing a common ground between the, uh, to allow the current sensor voltage sensor to actually measure what it's supposed to. It's establishing a common ground between the core device interface module and the battery circuit. Oh, you're not using the power distribution module or a motor controller. Okay. No, we got rid of those. So we don't actually have to use an external battery anymore. So when, when this has the relay open, that reading, that reading is an open circuit. Correct. Take the reading. Correct. That gives you the 14, whatever it might be. Yeah. Trigger the relay, that puts it under load. Take the next reading, that gives you your second point. Second voltage. You know that yeah. the circuit has 3.2 ohms. That gives you the ohms. You hard code that into the application. Turn off the relay because you're done with it. Do okay. that math, yes, and you get your resistance. Yes, correct. And the, the other thing you said is open voltage below a level means garbage. Uh, it usually does around 13, 13 volts or less. You're probably not going to have a good battery there. And resistance above three-ish point three, .3. Yes. is probably garbage as well. Yes, correct. So that quickly eliminates bad ones, but doesn't qualify excellent to good. Yes, it just means it, it just means it's not easily eliminatable. So, so <coughs> this test took very little time. So yeah. you're not load testing the battery for a no. very long time. No. So you can. We yeah, it has the ability to. He's but just doing. We can. Quick. It's kind of like uh, watching paint dry. Yeah, like, it's, it, it takes a while. It just this thing just heats up a lot. So what we've been and doing is the graph, yes. and that tells you the characterization. Got yeah. it. Okay. So we have a rudimentary at, at one of these yeah. with two headlamps. Oh yeah, okay. I, saw, I saw something about that online. We yes. have two headlamps, and we have a timer. And we put the battery on, we, we do a, a voltage test of the battery, and then we put the timer on, and we watch uh, the battery voltage go down. In, in two minutes, so we record the battery voltage at start and battery voltage at end um, with a 60 watt mm -hmm. um, draw on it. Mm -hmm. and that's how we test our batteries. And what we have found, and it was it's really interesting, a couple of our two batteries that are this old um, were like 13.2, 13.2, and then they just dropped after a minute. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. right. Um, if we go back, yeah, to yeah, yeah, go back to our yeah. let's go back to our battery graph. So, yeah, um, if you look at the violet or the purple one, that drop uh -huh. when it starts accelerating, you're probably starting to see that. Or yeah, the yellow is also. Yeah, the yellow one started with a high voltage, highest okay. voltage. So you are doing it for time. You are doing it yeah. for extended time. However, a uh, two-minute test is only to like right here. Right. So you probably only saw this part of it. Yeah. Right. So, so, so for your competition batteries, how long are you doing your, your, um, 
your drop test? Uh, it's not a set amount of time. It's until it goes below so it gets to 11.5. Uh, 11 yeah. So as you can see, it's different places. For oh, so <coughs> every time you do the test, you bring it down to 11.5. Yes. Interesting. And what's the, um, have you tested your robot at 11.5? Uh, no, we have not. The core power distribution module says it should be able to function on 9 volts. Yeah. But we did not <laughs> observe that. We, we observed uh, something contrary to that. So we prefer, we prefer to keep our batteries around 12.5 or more when we're actually going into a competition. When it starts, it should be freshly charged. So should be a freshly charged whatever we determine a good battery is. Right. So like I have 36 batteries I try to maintain. Oh wow. That's because we have, ten, mm -hmm. well, we have 10 teams. Oh, okay. Okay. And um, it's a nightmare for me. Oh, it's yeah. just you, a nightmare. It's a constant nightmare. You want one of these. This is, so, this is nice. Charging a charged battery is bad. Yes. How do you use this to determine whether or not I should charge the battery? Um, is that a simple voltage drop, or is actually, it an internal resistance? We actually had a, an issue with that right before we left, because we wanted, we want, we were trying to get our batteries loaded up and know which ones were charged or not, because with the whiteboard system we have, I talked about that, and mm -hmm. the checks or the X's, um, you, have to, you have to drain a battery a little bit before you can charge it. Mm -hmm. So we actually had to drain all of our batteries before we could charge them. So we had an hour or so, we drained all the batteries, and then we put them on the charger, and they were known charged, so we could put a check. But um, the, the issue comes when you don't know what a battery is, it's actually kind of a pain to deal with. Did you so, just drain them for a minute or two to get them down? Uh, yeah, we haven't really done any testing uh, about what, how far you actually need to, you need to drain them down to get the battery charger to observe the voltage drop, but so, that's something we're gonna do in the future. If I have a battery, and I put it on your thing, but instead of draining to 11, I just, and instead of instantaneous just gives me these two points. Those two points do or do not tell me I need to charge. Um, we haven't really tested that at all, what needs to be charged, but uh, we did notice that if you drain a battery and then you let it sit for a while, it appears to recover. And I think that's really just it get, regaining its open circuit voltage, so it's really going back up to here. Uh, Not necessarily. Yeah, that. so when you drain it, it'll be like, so measuring the voltage under load is probably a pretty good way to tell if the battery needs to be charged or not. But the issue is, notice how each battery is different under load. You've got, here this one's less than 12 under load. This one's um, almost, this one's above 13 under load. So you can't. Could you could you put it under load for thirty seconds? Look at the graph and where it starts and ends, and make any guesses. Well, we haven't actually collected any data about how big the voltage drop is or how long it takes to get there. So that's something we're going to do in the future, probably using this test bed. But, so switch over to the watt hour slide. So one of the concerns is that when you if you load your battery for 30 seconds, you're losing your watt hours immediately, right? The, your, your best, the, the most power you're gonna get, the, the, the best performance you're gonna get is right after you charge your battery and you put it on, and you'll start to, you start to give that up. So, so if, if I you- I think I actually did a poor job explaining this slide, but this shows voltage. So as the battery voltage is decreasing, you see that the slope of this line is uh, starting to go let more flat. So right here, you're seeing a huge increase in uh, in how many watt hours uh, it's putting out. So it looks like it's getting kind of warmed up right here, and then it really starts putting it out, and then it starts decreasing at the end. What it's actually saying is, well, what is that saying? Well, as your voltage is going up, your amps are going, when your voltage is going down, your amps are going up if your watt hours are staying the same. So if well, your watt hours, hours, you don't, don't have a measure of time not. there, so you can't see where the actually, time is This going. is in watt hours, not just in watts. Right. So this Just go back to the other one. So what this is saying is you lose a lot of voltage in Earth. the first 200 seconds. 
which yeah. means that's where a lot of your amps are going to. Except what's interesting <coughs> is uh, in the first uh, little bit of voltage loss, you're actually, it actually isn't gaining watt hours that fast. So it's not really pushing it out that fast until you get, uh, until you get kind of warmed up. Yes, but go back. If you have your 10 amp thing, you can't use that after two minutes because you're not going to have the voltage pushing out. So you're pushing a lot of amps early, but the life of the battery gives you a longer time at that voltage to accumulate yes. the height or the area under the watt hours. Yes, that's correct. So your point is well taken though. If I take 30 seconds to look at the slope, I'm burning it if it's good. Mm -hmm. how, how much power is being taken up on that real short one? Probably not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. It's going under 3.2 ohms for less than a second. So I'm not given what I Is the click both the on and off click? Is it happening so fast that I can't yeah. turn both? Oh yeah, you know you can hear both. Ting ching. So that's okay. on off. That's got to tell you if it's a good battery. Uh, yes, because that actually. Especially if you. If got we go back to our internal resistance calculation, uh, that's going to be the voltage. So that'll be y1 minus y2. So this is actually going to have a, about a two in the numerator. So that's actually going to be a higher internal resistance. Whereas let's see, look at per four or. Per, uh, but yeah, per point here. It's only going to be like a point 0.2 in the numerator. Okay, I know what I'm trying to ask. If the purple battery is at that point, and you do your immediate internal resistance test, what are the two readings you're going to get? Are you going to get something 14, or are you going to get something much um, lower? Well, remember when the battery is at this point, if you unload it, uh, the battery will actually increase back up to here. Right. Because it's not really, it's, it'll recover, it, or appear to recover, but it won't really recover. So you'll actually still get the same result. I recently did that with all the batteries. I drained them and tested the internal resistance again, and it came within a hundredth of an ohm to the same. So, so I guess the answer to my question, I think, is if the end of load voltage is less than 11, you got to charge it. Uh, or it's a bad battery, yes. It's either a bad battery. It may start off as a bad battery, yes, yes. But yes. If, if I have labeled that as my purple one, because the last time I tested it, I knew it was good, because I, I won't test it until, I'll maybe test it once a month or something. Right. So three weeks ago, that was my purple battery. Right now, under the quick test, it's under 11, so I'm going to charge it. Or it's between 12 and 13, so I'm probably not going to charge it until it bleeds because I don't want to charge a charged battery or I don't have to do anything. So the, the quick test and knowledge of whether it was a good or bad battery previously yes. tells yes, me whether correct, I need correct. to charge now. Okay. Yes. If, if you have the curve of the battery, <coughs> mm -hmm. then you can tell the charge state. Right. Very quick test. And then all I have to do is make sure I remember the curve state for the persisted somehow. I don't know what I'm trying to say there. This is very cool. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.